How y'all doing? Wonderful. Awesome. Um, whenever one of you gets a chance, can you shut the door? That would be awesome. Uh, so today we get to talk about all of the fun things involved in information security in terms of ethics, the mindset, whether or not you want to go into this field, and uh, the state of laws involving privacy and all kinds of fun stuff. We're going to do a double lecture today because there is a holiday tomorrow. So Veterans Day means that instead of uh, pushing this topic to next week, I'm just going to do a double lecture today and then send you home with lots and lots of homework because you have a whole extra day to do it because I don't believe in holidays. No, seriously, I believe in holidays. It's fine. Um, and then the second lecture, we're going to do some, the, the fun lecture that I have been really looking forward to for a long time, which is basically I'm going to teach you how to do all of the nasty things you want to know about on the internet if you don't already know them. If you don't already know them, it's my pleasure. If you do know them, don't reveal that to the rest of the class. <laughs> okay. White hat, black hat, mad hat. What's a white hat hacker? Someone who uses their knowledge for good. Someone who uses their knowledge for good. Okay. Jedi. All right. What's a black hat hacker? Opposite. Sith. Thank you. I feel like we already understand that the binary opposite of a Jedi is a Sith, so new favorite student. Uh, so the concept here is basically that there are a lot of tools that are available out there. Like any other tool, you can use the knowledge and the information that you have for good and for ill. We talked a little bit about what a black hat hacker can do to your online privacy yesterday. Uh, to understand a little bit more about what that is and and the, the world of information security, it does make sense to talk more than anything else about ethics. So here's a question that I have for you, and I've been looking forward to posing it to you for a while. Say that you knew the passwords for a million people at Apple, and you were able to get into their financial information because you had discovered a, um, a vulnerability in the encryption software that Apple uses to protect that information, that very, very personal information from all of those people. What would you do if you had that information? What's the right thing to do? What's the wrong thing to do? Okay. Right thing to do is to tell them about it so that they can improve their security. What would be the wrong thing to do? Exploit it. When you say exploit it, what do you mean exploit it? Use it for your own benefit and your own benefit alone. Use it for your own benefit and your own benefit alone. What's the other one you said, William? to post it online. Okay, fair enough. Now, how many emails do you think Apple gets every single day? A couple of thousand? I might take an order of 10 or 2 up on that. All right. Many hundreds of millions is more like it, probably. I mean, Apple, the company, probably has several hundred million emails go through, around, in and of its servers on an everyday basis. I think there's something like twenty to 40,000 people total that work at Apple. But think about all the emails that those people process in and out of the company. So your email gets ignored and you don't know what to do. But you know that that vulnerability is waiting out there, that millions of people could have their information compromised, their banking account information could be published out of the internet by somebody who isn't maybe as ethical as you. What's the next thing you do? What's that? Tell the, press. Tell the press you've discovered a vulnerability. That's a very interesting option. What are some other options? Bribery. What's that? Bribery. Say it again? Bribery. Bribery. Also an excellent option. Okay. When you say bribery, what do you mean by that? Threaten to show everyone the information unless you get something. Threaten to show everyone the information unless you get something. Are we verging into morally problematic territory now? Yeah. Yeah, we're, well, we're, we're solidly over in the morally problematic area when we talk about basically holding Apple up for blackmail at that point, right? But what do you do if the company's non-responsive, totally non-responsive? Find a developer community. Find a developer community. Now we're heading in the right direction. Maybe, sure, make, maybe make sure that what you found is, is the real true thing, that you're not just blowing hot air. The, the correct answer to any of these questions is, I don't know. What do you think the right thing is to do? There's always a case to be made on almost any side for the correct action to be made. I can tell you this. Whatever action you think is right in that moment that protects the most number of people from being taken advantage of, especially people who have no idea or understanding about the things that you understand, is probably heading in the right direction ethically. Does that make sense? If you need to do something because you understand that a million people could get robbed, and most of those people have no idea what a password even really is, right? then the action that you take 
in the direction of protecting the most people is probably heading towards the correct moral ground, okay? And there are ways to do that in, in an ethical sense. There are a lot of ethical reporting communities, companies, interesting things like that out there. Of course, one of the problems that you might face is if you've discovered a vulnerability and you reveal that, but you don't reveal the vulnerability itself, then what happens if the company issues you a gag order and you can't reveal it? That's, that is an out there question. This, these are the kind of ethics and, and interesting questions that are coming up. And the reason we talked yesterday about the information security field expanding so greatly is because 20% new jobs every year sent for the last five years. Are you crazy? This field is blowing up, hugely blowing up. It's very likely that some or all of you are going to have some degree of contact with the information security world. Some of you are probably going to go directly into it. So if that's the case, Start thinking now about the right thing to do so that when you find yourself in these situations, you've got some kind of degree of, of um, moral guidance. Why am I hitting the ethics and the morals so hard right now? Because that dictates what you do. Because that dictates what you do, right? It, are those the only things that dictate what you do, what the right thing to do is? Situation could. Situation could. What else could? What's that? People have different ethics and morals. Different ethics and morals. True. What is the thing that usually constrains our action in the United States of America and globally? Law. The law. Bingo. What laws cover all of these areas? Zero of them, basically. Or laws that were written by people that have no comprehension of computational tactics, of encryption, of what any of this stuff is, right? Most laws are, are decades behind the technology that's available, which means that it is very important for you to develop some kind of moral and ethical compass that is um, grounded in community and service of that community before you start taking actions that can hurt people. All right? Um, laws don't cover barely any of this, and the laws that may be used to try to apply to any of this are written badly, broadly, and poorly. Um, badly, broadly, and poorly doesn't necessarily just, uh, badly and poorly in this case are not the same thing. Badly can mean with people who have um, actual ill intent. Poorly really means that they don't know how to write the law itself. And then cluelessly, they, they don't understand any part of what's going on here. Try to explain to an 80-year-old judge what effect the, the difference between 256 and 512, 512 bit encryption is, and they, their eyes will glaze over. They don't understand the difference, functionally or mechanically, right? So you want to make sure, and it actually there's are, there are a couple of cool judges out there, so you do want to try to hope that you get those guys. Um, the, uh, the reason we're talking about this again is just make sure that you have that check against your own action by checking in with people in the community about what the ethical and moral action is to take. And there's a lot of people that dance along different lines, have very different opinions. They, they are frustrated at not being heard, and so sometimes they take very loud action. Um, I can sympathize sometimes with those actions, sometimes I don't. It's, it's very case dependent, and it should be. Law sets precedent, but so does community and moral action, all right? Let's talk a little bit more about what that really means. When I say uh, la fidar an, I'm pronouncing it horribly, what is that? What does that mean? La fidar an. You are being watched. Okay? Where's the quote from? What's that? Star Trek is an excellent guess, but it's not Star Trek. That's in Elvish. Oh, okay. Yes, and it's from Fellowship of the Ring, and Celeborn is the one who says it to Aragorn. You are being watched. Okay? So that doesn't just mean your actions are being watched. It means that the people that you work with, the, the choices that you make, people notice them. We talk about the, the right action to take a lot of the times in technology because no one's covering any of this stuff with laws. We are governed by best practices and our responsibility to the community. So you're not just being watched by scary people in black clothing. And I, no, I'm not one of those people. Um, but you are being watched by the people around you. So try to set a good example to them with your choices that you make. You have the opportunity to have a college education and you have the opportunity to get training in these areas. Try to help set an example for the people that don't have that opportunity, okay? Um, the next thing we are going to talk about is, where did it go? Okay, the state of laws, and this is really important. I've hit that there aren't really laws, but there's a couple of important pieces of legislation and interesting information that have come out very recently. There is a law called CISA, which you should all take a look at, and I'm going to have you take a look at it. 
something called Wassenaar. You can Google that too. There's two A's in Wassenaar. Um, the most important thing to me personally, and that's why I'm going to use it as an example, is something that was just decided in the European Union about three weeks ago. It's very interesting because most of you probably haven't heard about this decision. In the EU, um, the European Court of Justice, I believe, ruled that um, American Section 230 safe harbor laws aren't really protecting European Union citizens against the dissemination of their data across state lines. Now that single decision made by the European Court of Justice, it matters a lot to me. Why do you think it might matter a lot to me? You know what I do, the, the other thing that I do, I'm CEO of a company that protects HR information, right? Okay, so w with that other thing that I do, besides sit here and pontificate to all of you, what, what am I doing on an everyday basis? Why does this information security situation matter to me? Go ahead. You're doing business in Europe. Uh -huh. Because what if just one of the companies that I'm working with, and we, of course we have this all handled, but I'm talking with you about it now for you know the purposes of the future. What if one of the companies that I'm servicing hires a European Union citizen? Right? What if, what if they do that? What matters then? I have to follow the laws there, exactly. But how do I follow the laws about that when the European Court of Justice determines that as an American, American standards of safe harbor provisions, storing data carefully, basically, in a safe harbor certification, is insufficient to protect the data of those citizens? What do I do? What if there is no certification? There isn't right now. We're in a legal blank land right now. I've just been told I can't do something, but I haven't been told what I can do, right? This is a very common state to be in. The only thing that I can do, really, is protect data to the best of my capacity and far in advance of what the safe, uh, the safe harbor laws provide for, right? So I can take what I think is the moral and ethical action, which is to protect that data to the best of my capacity and far beyond any baseline standard, but at the same time, what do I do? Right? And that right there is a very small, very specific example of something that affects people all around the world trying to innovate that cuts off a path of innovation. Does this affect companies like Facebook or Microsoft? No. They all have their own separate agreements with the European Court of Justice and the European Union. Large companies are not affected by rulings like this as much as small companies are. There's a lot of information out there about how CISA and those, the determination by the ECJ um, are, is drastically harming the capacity of small companies to innovate and compete against the larger ones in a global market as a result of the craziness of international regulation. This is just a small example of the kind of crazy ethical and moral conundrum that you, conundra that you come up against as you're, as you're working in information security. And if we're talking about this field over this week, I mean, we've got games and mobile development and all these different things that all these options and technology that you can go into. Uh, this is extraordinarily lucrative. This is probably the most lucrative of all of the fields that we're talking about. Game development is not the most lucrative. Um, it may be the most fun and the most available to you locally. Information security is probably by far the most lucrative. Becoming a, um, an all-around or specialized web application developer is also very remunerative. Systems administration is good, pretty good, but it's not going to be as big as someone who's a developer who's inventing things in terms of financial remuneration only. I actually happen to like being a sysadmin myself, so I, I'm uh, several other skill sets, but actually one of my favorite ones has always been being a sysadmin. I just like running computers and making them do tricks. It's fun, right? Okay, your question? Oh, I was going to ask, so they need to slowly regulate and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. right? That is a very good question. The question of whether or not the net is truly neutral. You've heard of the, the, the laws on net neutrality. We're very fortunate that the U.S. Congress, was it Congress or Supreme Court, I forget. There was a decision recently made about net neutrality. Can one of you take a look at it and see which one it was? It's either, it's either a bill that didn't pass or a Supreme Court decision, and I forgot which one it was. Um, I think it was a bill that didn't pass. What's that? What's that? SOPA was previous. I'm talking about something very, very recently maybe in the last six weeks. Anyway, a decision was... Did you hear about the UK? No, I didn't hear about the UK. Okay, yeah, throw it on random and we'll take a look at it in a moment in the Slack channel. 
So the decisions about net neutrality have to, what, what, what is net neutrality in this case? What does it mean and what does it matter? Because we're, we're talking about this regulation because there's an ethical component to this too. What is net neutrality? This is a very important law about the state of the internet. Mm. Yes, it, it does have to do with the, the speed of what is shown on the internet. How does it have to do with the speed of what is shown on the internet? Imagine, imagine I'm served by Comcast. So, so what, is, what does Comcast get to do? They can throttle web pages. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or Netflix can have slower rates than everyone else until they what? Right there. That is not net neutrality, right? That is being judged based on the traffic that's coming in. And Netflix is something like, I think at like 7 o'clock at night, Netflix is like 47% of all web traffic at this point. So good on them. They deliver one hell of a product. I totally love them. I'm seriously catching up on Rain right now, if you guys have not seen that. That is the greatest, nastiest soap opera ever. I do have a deep fondness for trashy, trashy television. I mean, Scandal and Rain and just horrible television like that, right? It's super bad for you, but I love it all. So I, I work at the same time. It's fine, you know, but I do have an eyeball over on the corner watching truly terrible television. But the outfits are fabulous. Anyway, so net neutrality is the capacity to tell internet service providers that they cannot change or throttle traffic based on the source of that traffic and the destination of that traffic. And it's really important in terms of regulation to make sure that the same kind of chilling effect doesn't happen with someone like me. What if I am forced to pay an additional tax based on who I'm serving as a, and, and someone who's providing a web app to people for their, their good and their benefit, right? It'd be very easy for Comcast or any other um, ISP, internet service provider, to say, we have a startup fee or a program that you can get on that's gonna let you deliver your traffic for free for right now, but later on you're gonna pay for it, right? And then if you don't pay for it, what happens? All of a sudden, my service becomes slow and buggy, and sometimes it magically doesn't work, you know, until we have a conversation in the alley and you get me paid, right? That's what happens with net neutrality or the lack thereof. Okay. So that is a very good example of another kind of regulation that sounds totally different than the regulation that just happened in the, or than the ruling that just happened in the ECJ. But ultimately, when you see regulation like that, mostly it starts to stifle the small businesses that don't have the capacity to compete with bigger organizations that have um, individual agreements with the entities in charge. These companies have big legal departments, and they have the capacity and the bandwidth to develop those out. So. This is the kind of thing I'm, I'm, I'm inculcating you with, and, and low academia is full of all manner of politics, right? Politics one way, politics another. I, I have a lot of opinions on a lot of the stuff that I tell you in here. Most of the time I don't give you what my opinion actually is of any of this, but I strongly, strongly feel like working towards less regulation and l um, uh, the, 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 definitely the ability of the internet to stay neutral in terms of traffic delivery is very important. So, and, and you can take a look at why that is. You may actually feel that it's important to have some form of regulation on bandwidth. Maybe you want to see, you know, pornography take up less bandwidth on the internet. Good luck with that, but yes. I don't know if they still do, but I know Comcast mm -hmm. would basically they just all the internet the higher the Uh-huh. So yes, Comcast yeah. has in fact throttled certain people in this room that, yeah, shh, uh, 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 yeah, there, there we go, there we go. I'm sure that some people in this room who are not me have experienced that before when visiting websites that are somewhat problematic. So <clears throat> we can talk more about that in the next lecture. Uh, but that kind of thing is exactly what I'm talking about. What happens when Comcast has a different political opinion than a company that's delivering con content to you? What happens when websites that are pr explicitly promoting net neutrality are the ones being throttled by an internet service provider? Starts to matter an awful lot then, doesn't it? That's why a decision to class the internet as a utility is a very important one, so that it can't be denied to people who are of a lower socioeconomic status, so that people who have strong political beliefs cannot be throttled, literally as well as figuratively, and in some cases, very, very literally around the world, right? So that might be why Comcast isn't too particularly thrilled, as well as all of the other ISPs in the area and around the world, about things like strong internet encryption. Why? Because they can't tell then what you're slurping into your your box at home, right? That VPN does that. Mm -hmm. Not a proxy, a VPN.
Yes. I mean, you can use a proxy, and that's a whole different. Setting up a proxy, Squid 3, all of that, whatever you want to set up really easily through another box, that is a very special topic. And it's I've rolled a couple of them at this point, and if you want to know more about that, you can have an offline conversation about it. It's a great idea. Depends on what you want to do it for. It's usually mostly uh, used to defeat internal corporate firewalls, which always happy to help somebody figure that part out. All right. <coughs> So those are, that is the state of laws regarding what's happening on the internet right now. And I strongly encourage you all to take a look at that, all right? Any more questions about the state of the internet in terms of laws, the morals and ethics involved in being someone who understands vulnerabilities and reports them to companies? I'm, I'm really encouraging you all to take a look, a, a strong look at the state of these laws because you're technologists and you're going to be going into, at a very least, at the at bare minimum, any associated field with this kind of, of regulation that will hang over your head and it will matter to you, especially if you want to start innovating, you want to start your own companies. And I want to see every single one of you do that, by the way. So if this, ha if this is something that you care about, look hard into it because it's going to matter more and more and more. Any last questions?